Let's go ahead and read together verses 6 to 13 today. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll continue on in verse 14 to 18 and start looking at some objections to unconditional election. But today we're just going to establish the truth of unconditional election. Okay, Romans 9 verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Lord, we come to you and we pray that you would give us a heart that is willing to receive the truth of your word. God, give us a humble heart, Lord, that can bow before your word and receive direction, receive instruction, receive commands. So that's what we need most, most of all, Lord, is, is a heart willing to embrace what you reveal in your word. I pray you'd give me the ability to clearly communicate what you have communicated here to us. May the Holy Spirit speak again through these verses. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my question for you this morning is, why do some people come to Christ when other people don't? It's a very simple question. Like in a family, um, maybe you have five or six children. Two or three of them end up coming to Christ and two or three of them don't. They have the same parents, they attend the same church, they hear the same sermons, they've heard, all heard the gospel, the parents love each of those children equally and they pray for their children and they teach them the gospel, but yet some of them are converted and some are not. And so that's the question, why? Why does that happen? Or let's say there's a young couple and they're feeling the need to be part of a church. They never have before. They have a friend that's just invited them to their church and so they end up going. Well, they, they go, they hear the word of God preached, the gospel is communicated. The wife listens intently and she's convicted of her sin and she believes on Jesus Christ and is saved and she lives a life of devotion to Christ for the rest of her life and the husband never does come to love Christ and live for him. Why does that happen? They're hearing the same message. I believe the Apostle Paul answers that question in these verses. I believe he's telling us why some are saved and others are not. Now, before we can get into it, let's review the first five verses because this is necessary to understand in order to understand verses 6 to 13. In verses 1 to 5, Paul says he has great sorrow and unceasing grief in his heart for the, his fellow Jewish kinsmen who are not saved. Most Jews of, G, of Paul's day were not believing on Jesus Christ. They had rejected him. And so they were going to perish in their sins. And Paul has this great sorrow because he wants them to be saved. He wants them to come to know Christ as their Messiah, but yet they're not doing that. And, and it, it's even more tragic when you consider the great privileges and advantages that they had. And he lists eight different spiritual privileges in verses 4 and 5. But then he comes to verse 6 and he says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. Now, we might think the word of God had failed. Now what do we mean by the word of God in verse 6? We went over this a little bit last week, but let me help you see it again. If you compare verse 6 and verse 11, you're going to see that the word of God in verse 6 is the purpose of God of verse 11. In verse 6 it says, it's not as though the word of God has failed. And the word failed means to fall to the ground. 
He said in verse 6, but even though most of Israel is not believing on Jesus, the word of God has not fallen. It stands. It still stands. Well, how so? Look at verse 11. Though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. So the word of God in verse 6 is equal to the purpose of God in verse 11. He says these things stand. In spite of the fact that many Israelites are not believing in Jesus as Messiah, the word of God, the purpose of God, his sovereign purpose, which is according to his choice, that still stands. Why? Why is it true that God's purpose is still being successful even though so many Jews are not saved? It's because of the end of verse 6. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now Ola, can you put up that picture? Ola made it, created a little slide. Okay. Notice the big circle represents all of the physical descendants of Abraham. Everyone born from Abraham would be included in the big circle. But within the big circle, there's a smaller circle. And I'm just going to call this the true Israel. Um, Paul calls some different things within this chapter, but I'll, we'll just refer to it as the true Israel. He says, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. They are not all the true Israelites who are descended from Abraham. Do you guys see, do you understand what I'm trying to communicate here? So there's this whole lineage of people coming from Abraham, but some of them were true Israel and some weren't. Some were saved, some were lost. Just because you're a Jew doesn't mean you were going to be saved. Your Jewishness didn't save you. Even in the Old Testament, people were saved the same way we are, through faith in God. Like it says in Genesis 15, 4, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So we believe God today. We believe God who communicates to us the gospel of his son Jesus Christ. And that is righteousness is reckoned to us when we believe. So we're saved in the same way Abraham was. The word of God has not failed because they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now, I'm just going to go ask three questions as we move through this text. And as we get answers to those three questions, I think we're going to understand... We're going to understand God's sovereign purposes of salvation. We're going to understand why the word of God has not failed even though many Israelites were not saved. So the first question is this, were all of uh, Abraham's descendants part of God's true Israel? Well, I think we already know the answer. They are not, he says in verse 6, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now what does he mean? He means there's a distinction between God's true people and all of Abraham's physical descendants. All of ethnic Israel. In other words, you could call the true Israel spiritual Israel if you wanted to. Do you remember back in Romans chapter 2? At the very end of that chapter, Paul says, He is not a true Jew. Let me find it. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. There's a difference between an ethnic Israelite, a, a person who's born from Abraham, and a true Jew, who is, who is a Jew because of the work of the Spirit upon the heart to make him part of this new Israel of God. Now, back in Romans 9, let's just notice how Paul identifies the physical descendants of Abraham. In verse 8, he says, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. So he calls them the children of the flesh. Those are the physical descendants of Abraham. They're children of the flesh. Well, what does he call this Israel that is within Israel? The, the true Israel. What does he call them? Well, let's look at verse 8. It's not the children of the flesh who are what? Children of God. That's his first designation for them. But the children of the promise, that's his second, are regarded as descendants. They are the true Israel within uh, physical, ethnic Israel. 
they're called the children of the God, are the children of God, and they're also called the children of promise. Now let's just think about those expressions Paul uses here: children of God and children of promise. What does Paul mean by those designations? The children of God. Well, he already mentioned the children of God back in chapter 8. Let's just turn back one chapter and take a look. Romans 8, 16. He said, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Who's he talking about? He's talking about a saved person. He's talking about a born again person. If you just read the context, he's talking about someone that the Holy Spirit leads to put to death the deeds of the body. In verse 13, he's talking about a person who has not received a spirit of slavery, but a spirit of adoption. He's adopted into God's family. He's a person that the Holy Spirit indwells and testifies that he's actually God's child. So this is a born again saved person when we read about it, children of God. So that's how Paul uses the term. If we were to look at John, John uses the term in the same way. John 1.12, But as many as received Christ, to them he gave the right or the authority to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the child of God is one who's born of God. Not of his own will, or the will of man, or the will of flesh, or some kind of heredity. He's born directly of God. A miraculous birth takes place. So that's how Paul uses the the phrase, the children of God. What about children of promise? That's another designation for these same people. The true Israel. We'll go over to Galatians 4. And he tells us in verse 28 and 29. He says, and you brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, which was Ishmael, his older brother, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, that's Isaac, so it is now also. So what he's saying is that the child of promise is the one who's been born of the spirit. The same thing that we just learned about the children of God. All those born of the Spirit, all those who are born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, they're called children of God and children of the promise, and they're the ones that make up the true Israel within greater Israel. Okay, so going back to Romans 9. Let's paraphrase Romans 9, 6. But it is not as though the sovereign purpose of God has failed. Why not? Because God has been faithful to save all of the true Israel. His purpose was for the true Israel, not the physical descendants of Abraham, but the spiritual seed. God made promises and had these sovereign purposes that included them. Not every physical descendant of Abraham was included in God's sovereign purpose of salvation. But the true Israel, the spiritual Israel, the children of God, the children of promise, these people were the ones that God had chosen to save through promise. Now, this is why so many Jews were accursed and cut off. They weren't true Israelites. They weren't part of the true Israel. They were only physical descendants of Abraham. But they, they didn't follow in the footsteps of their father Abraham when it came to faith, like we read in Romans chapter 4. God never promised to save every ethnic Israelite. He promised to save all true Israelites. And in fact, He Himself, God Himself, creates this new Israel within Israel. He brings them into existence and saves them. So the Word of God has not failed. It applies only to those people that God is saving out of ethnic Israel. Does that that make sense? Okay, great. So that's question number one. Were all of Abraham's descendants part of God's true Israel? No. Question number two. How did Paul know that there was a true Israel within Israel? How did he know that? Well, it's because of what he says in verses 7 to 13. He gives us examples of Isaac and then Jacob, Isaac's brother Ishmael and Jacob's brother Esau, and he shows that Isaac was included in true Israel, Ishmael was not. Jacob was included in the true Israel, Esau was not. 
And that's what he's doing as he's moving through now and br bringing these two examples. So let's take a look at Isaac and Ishmael. Remember Abraham had two sons. His first son was through Hagar, who is the Egyptian handmaid. And we might say, well, of course, of course, Ishmael would not have been um, in the true Israel because Ishmael had a mother who was a Gentile. So that's why. That's why uh, Ishmael was not included in God's covenant line that culminated with the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But he says in verse 7, Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. Not through Ishmael, but it's going to be through Isaac. In other words, the covenant line is being, God is sovereignly choosing where the covenant line is going to go. It's not going to go through Ishmael, it's going through Isaac instead. And God made that decision. But then also Jacob was included in the true Israel, not Esau. How do we know that? Well, because he tells us in verse 10, not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. Okay, so now we don't have two different children with two different mothers anymore, right? We have two different children of the same parents, same mother, same father, and they're twins. They're not even 13 years apart. They're born on the same day, the same hour. So what's going to happen then? Does, is, are both of them going to be included in the true Israel? No. What we find out is that God says, well, verse 11, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So God is making a distinction in verse 12 and 13 between these two twins, Jacob and Esau. Esau was born first, first and usually the firstborn had preeminence within the children. He received a double portion of the inheritance. He was like, if the father died, he would be the lord of the family. He would be the one in authority. But God deliberately reverses that order here. And now the older one, who should have been the preeminent one, is going to serve the younger. Now, why is that going to happen? Because <laughs> God, God said. God made a choice. And he's quoting from Genesis 25, 23. If you wanted to take a look at that. Uh, God actually speaks to Rebecca, the mother. In verse 22, it says, The children, Jacob and Esau, struggled together within her, within her womb. And she said, If it is so, well, then why, the, why then am I in this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. So she's asking the Lord, What's going on? Why is this struggle going on inside of me? And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. And two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. So Ishmael was going to be the father of the Edomites. No, it's not Ishmael. Esau, not Ishmael. Esau was the father of the Edomites. Jacob was the father of the Israelites. And the Edomites would serve the Israelites. God made a choice that this nation is going to serve this nation. This older son is going to be subservient to the younger son. And then he quotes Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, and he says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So there again, God is making a distinction between the two sons and saying that he's going to do something for Jacob that he's not going to do for Israel. I mean for Esau. Sorry about that, I'm getting all these words mixed up. It's hard for me to keep all these names straight. But anyway, if you go back to Malachi... Chapter 1, verse 2. It says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Of course, God is addressing the people of Israel. I have loved you. But you say, how have you loved us? And God responds, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. In other words, I 
loved this one, I hated this one. Now, of course, right away, we start thinking, what in the world's going on here? I thought God loved everyone exactly alike. Doesn't God love everybody the same? I mean, most Christians believe that, that God loves everyone exactly the same, and he doesn't do anything for one that he doesn't do for another. Well, if he does love everyone exactly the same, I don't understand Romans 9, 11, or 13, because there he says that he loved Jacob and he hated Esau. But what does he mean by hating Esau? Some, <laughs> someone once came to a, a Bible teacher and they said, I've got a problem with Romans 9, 13. It says that God hated Esau. I, I don't get that. And the Bible teacher says, I have a problem with Romans 9, 13 too. But my problem is that it says, Jacob I loved. And he said, I do not get why God would love Jacob. <laughs> I mean, Jacob was a rat. If you read his story, he was a con man, a swindler. He was making deals with God. He was deceiving his father. He was, you know, ripping off the birthright from his brother by all this scheming and conniving. He, he was not a great godly man. But it says God loved him. So, I, I think I agree. I, I ha God has every right to hate every member of the human race, if you, if you really think about it, because we're all rebels to his throne rights. What does a king do with a rebel to his throne? Uh, he exercises his authority against them. Now, God can, if he chooses, to show great mercy and grace, but he doesn't have to. He has every right to exercise hatred or wrath against those who are enemies of his. Now, let's try to think through this. Esau I hated. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples there in Luke chapter 14? And he says, unless you hate your father or mother or brother or sister, or wife or children, you can't be my disciple. Did he mean that we have to have this malicious animosity towards our parents? And we have to have this hatred in our heart that we detest them? No, I, that's not what Jesus is getting at. We can understand Luke 14, 26 if we do a parallel to Matthew 10, 37. And there it says, No one who loves father or mother more than me is worthy of me. No one who loves son or daughter more than me is worthy of me. So what does it mean to hate father, mother, brother, sister, wife, or children? It means to love them more than Jesus. So when God says here, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated... It means that he made a preference. He did something for Jacob that he didn't do for Israel. And the difference between those two things seemed the, like the difference between love and hatred. What did he do for Esau? He included him in the true Israel. He brought him in. And he passed over his brother Esau. And these two nations now, one is included amongst God's people and one is not. The Israelites and the Edomites. There's the second question. How did Paul know that there was a true Israel within Israel? Because he just looked back in the book of Genesis and he saw God doing it. He saw God making a distinction between these children. There's two examples of physical descendants not included <clears throat> in true Israel. Ishmael and Esau. Okay, question number three. And this is probably the most important part. How did someone become part of God's true Israel? How did that happen? Well, let's think about Isaac for a minute. How was Isaac made a part of God's true Israel? Well, this is hard because Isaac didn't exist. <laughs> and his parents couldn't cause him to exist. They tried. They tried over and over to, to have a son. But uh, Sarah was barren. She had gone through the time of life. She had no more natural ability to create a child through her husband. It was impossible for her to bear a child. And so how is this child of the promise going to come into existence? Well, God does it. God does the miraculous. God does the supernatural. And he brings forth a child when there's no human explanation for the way that child can actually be born. God makes it happen, miraculously. He made a promise to um, Abraham and to Sarah. Um, here we go, verse 9. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son, 
So Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. And then, uh, so he makes a promise to them that in one year's time, I'm going to come, Sarah's going to have a son. Even though they couldn't produce the son, God could produce it. And that comes from Genesis 18 verse 10. And, and so what Paul's doing is he's illustrating what he's already said back in Romans 4 verse 17. He says, God is the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. That's how Israel came into existence and God separated him from Ishmael and made him part of the covenant line through which the promises were going to be given and the Messiah would ultimately be revealed. And you know what? The way God called Isaac into existence is a picture of the way that every saved person becomes a Christian. It, it happened miraculously. It, was, it wasn't the will of man. It wasn't the will of flesh. It wasn't of blood. This one was born of God. And Isaac's supernatural birth pictures our supernatural birth. If you're a Christian, if you've been born again, it happened to you just like it happened to Isaac. My mom and dad couldn't cause me to be a Christian. And Debbie and I can't cause our son to be a Christian, though we would love to. If we had the power, we would do it, but we don't. God alone is able to cause regeneration to happen in the soul of a sinner. So that's what we see happening. There's this picture of, of regeneration in the New Testament church. That's Isaac. That's how he was included. God brought him forth supernaturally and then told him that he was going to be the one through whom the covenant would go. But what about Jacob? How was he made part of the true Israel? Well, Paul tells us both how it didn't happen and also how it did. So let's look at first at how Jacob was not made part of the true Israel. It's in verse 11. It says, Though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Now twice there in verse 11, he tells us how this didn't happen. He says the twins were not yet born. They were still in the womb. They hadn't done anything good or bad because they're not even, they're not even born yet. They're still in the womb. It was so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand not because of works. So he's very emphatic here that Jacob was not chosen because of works. Jacob was not chosen because of anything good he did. Well then why was, Jason, why was Jacob singled by God to be part of this true Israel? Why did God say that the older will serve the younger? And why did he say Jacob I love but Esau I hated? He did that because he made a unconditional choice of Jacob and passed over Esau according to verse 11. Now let me try to explain this. Your justification is conditional. Now, when I say justification, I mean God pronouncing you righteous because of your faith in Christ. God reckons you to be righteous when you believe upon His Son. That's justification. That's conditional. It's conditioned upon faith. Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, Okay? There is a, a human condition must be met before a person can be justified. But let me say this. Election is unconditional. Justification is conditional. You have to meet the condition of faith. But you don't have to meet the condition of faith to be elected. Because God elects you before you believe. And that's why you end up believing. is because of His choice. Um, this is interesting. If you go to the end of verse 11, it says, not because of works. What would we normally expect him to say? Not because of works, but because of faith. Because Paul usually contrasts faith and works. He does that in this book. He does it in the same chapter. Chapter 9, verse 32. It says, he says, Israel did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. And so they stumbled over the stumbling stone. Or if you were to go back to Romans 3.27. 
In Romans 3.27, Paul says, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. So often faith and works are put juxtaposed against each other. And so we might think, if we're reading Romans 9, that he would say, so that God's purpose, according to God's choice, would stand not because of works, but because of faith. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. In other words, God made this sovereign choice to choose Jacob over Esau because Jacob believed and Esau didn't. But that's exactly not what Paul says here. If ever Paul had a reason to, I'm struggling to figure out a way to put into words here. If there was ever a time in Paul's writings where he should have, if he had, if he had meant to say that our salvation happened because of our faith, this is the time he should have said it. Because by saying it the way he says it, it would totally mislead his audience, his readers. He seems to be saying it did not have to do with anything good or bad. It did not have to do with works. It had to do with God's purpose, God's choice, and God's call. That's what verse 11 says. So, before we can be justified, we have to believe. But before we can believe, we have to be chosen and called. That's what he's saying in verse 11. Unconditional election is simply, we're simply saying that God chooses apart from man meeting any condition. The only condition for someone to be chosen unto salvation is the will of God. It's not something that we meet, it's something that's within God himself. So that's not, it did not happen. Jacob was, did not become part of the true Israel because of him meeting some kind of a condition, like works, or even faith. Well then how did it happen? Let's, let's review verse 11. Though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. There's three things in verse 11 that tell us how it did happen. Number one, God's purpose. Number two, God's choice. Number three, God's call. So let's look at those three things. God's purpose. God's purpose. What does Paul mean when he talks about God's purpose? Well, let's just look at three other verses to talk about the purpose of God to see if they shed light on what the purpose of God is all about. And we've already studied one of them. It's Romans 8.28. There Paul talks about God's purpose. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. That tells us that God's call that issues in salvation is governed by God's purpose. God's purpose is previous. The call comes because of the prior purpose. God has a purpose and that purpose governs who is called and how they're called. And so that call is according to this prior purpose. So the purpose was, was determined before the call went out. Okay? Let's look at another one. Um, 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.9. He speaks about the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Now think about that. Think about the words. This purpose and this grace was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. When Paul talks about this, he says it was from before the foundation of the world. Here in 2 Timothy 1.9, he says it was from all eternity. Literally, the Greek says before times eternal is when this purpose and grace was granted to us. <laughs> it's rooted in eternity. So God is not responding to situations. He's not responding to people. He establishes this purpose before anyone exists or anything exi exists. Also, notice that his purpose in verse 9 is link linked with Jesus Christ. It's according to his own purpose and grace which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. So God's purpose 
is connected with his son. Thirdly, notice that it's connected with grace. God's own purpose and grace. So this is a gracious purpose. It's a purpose to bestow grace, favor, undeserved kindness and favor upon ill-deserving sinners. And then notice also, just like in Romans 9, it rules out works as the reason for why we're called. He saved us and called us with a holy calling. It is not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace. Folks, we weren't saved by accident. We were saved on purpose, but it wasn't our purpose. It was God's purpose. It was His purpose that called us into being, just like Isaac. Let's take a look at another one that talks about the purpose of God. Ephesians 1.11. Ephesians 1.11 says, Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Now verse 11 tells us that we were predestined according to his purpose. Now Romans 8.28 says that we were called according to his purpose. Ephesians 1.11 says we were predestined according to his purpose. Evidently the purpose of God is that which brings forth his, pre, his predestination, his predestined plan, and it brings forth our calling. It brings bo forth both. Notice it's also free. God is free as he develops this purpose. He's not constrained by anything out of himself because he says in verse 11 that he works all things after the counsel of His will. It's not our will that He works it after. It's His own will. And notice the goal in verse 12. He says, This purpose, which is rooted in eternity and is free and sovereign, is to the end, here's the end goal, that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. There's the goal. God wants a people. He wants a true Israel within Israel. He wants the true people of God born of the Spirit, children of God, children of the promise. He wants this group and he's creating this group. Why? That they would be to the praise of his glory. That they would redound to his praise and magnify him, exalting him and bringing glory to the one who not only physically created them but spiritually recreated them. And we find the same thing in Ephesians 1 verses 4 to 6. He says, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will. The kind intention of His will is almost a synonym for God's purpose. It was His, in fact it says, the good pleasure of His will in the King James. And he says, it was to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Ephesians 1.12 says, God's purpose was to the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1.6 says, the kind intention of his will was to the praise of the glory of his grace. The, the Lord is creating this special people for his own possession that would be to the praise of his glory, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Now with that as a background, I think we understand a little bit more about God's purpose. When it says there in Romans 9.11, Though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, we understand it's rooted in eternity. It's free. It's not constrained by anything outside of himself. He brings to pass um, his predestination and his calling because of this prior purpose, this divine purpose. What about his choice? So that God's purpose according to his choice would stand. The word choice means election. In fact, the King James, I think, says um, God's purpose according to election might stand. So, if, when we have a presidential election, what are we doing? Right? We're, main, we're choosing the next president. Now, we're casting our ballot. We're casting our vote. But when you add up all those votes, the American people have chosen the next president. So election and choice are the same thing. To choose is to elect. If I say I am electing to have my name removed from the ballot, 
All I'm saying is that I'm making a decision. I'm choosing to have my name removed from that ballot. So that's what election means. When it says God's purpose according to his choice or, or according to election, he's simply talking about God's electing purpose. If Paul meant that Jacob was chosen because God knew that he would become a spiritual man and Esau would be a man of the flesh, and I've heard that interpretation. Have you? I mean, I don't know if you've ever... Yeah, like, I, I, I've heard preaching where they got to Romans chapter 9 and they're trying to make sense of it and they're doing the very best they can, but they say, well, God chose... Jacob, because he knew Jacob was going to become a spiritual man, and he knew that Esau would never be a spiritual man. And, but that's the exact opposite of what he's saying. He's trying to help us to see it had nothing to do with them. They were in their mother's womb. They hadn't done anything good or bad, and God made a choice then, before anything happened. And he says it's, it wasn't of works. It wasn't anything that they would do, whether they'd be spiritual or unspiritual. He points all the emphasis on the reason to God's purpose, God's choice, and God's call. Well, let's look at God's call. So that God's purpose according to his choice would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. And we've already studied this, the call of God. It's, it's the Lord opening the eyes, the spiritual eyes, to see the beauty of Jesus Christ. It's him opening the heart to be able to respond to the gospel. It's him changing the heart, Ezekiel 36, and giving us a new heart, taking out the heart of stone, giving us a heart of flesh, putting his spirit within. It's regeneration. It's the new birth. That's the call of God in verse 11. So what is Paul teaching in this passage? He's teaching that God's purposes have not failed, because it was not God's purpose to save every physical descendant of Abraham. It was God's purpose to create within all of the physical descendants of Abraham a true Israel. And he calls them the children of God, the children of the promise. And the way they become part of the true Israel is God does a, a miracle. They're born of the Spirit. And that being born of the Spirit is a result of God's eternal purpose, His choice of them, and His call that brings them to Jesus Christ. Okay, so I've, I've delivered my soul here. The, folks, this isn't easy to preach this passage. <laughs> it's hard. Um, but let's, let's get to some application. Okay, let's say you're in this room today and you don't know whether God has chosen you to be saved or not. Would you like to know that you have been chosen of God? Come to Jesus Christ Amen. right now. Amen. Repent of your sins and put your faith in His Son now. God is offering you everlasting life. Choose Him. Make a decision. I have decided to follow Jesus. Choose Christ right now. Put your faith in Him. Amen. Decide that you will yield yourself and humble yourself to the Son of God and become a disciple, a follower of Jesus. If you will do that, you can know that He chose you. Jesus said in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me shall come to me. Amen. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. All that the Father gives me shall come. Come to Jesus right now and you know that the Father gave you to Jesus. You can deduce that because of what Jesus said. And if you will come to Him on God's terms, if you will come, He promises not to cast you out. Some people think election means that God is damning many people who ought to be saved. It's exactly the opposite. Election means God is saving many people who ought to be damned. We, we get it exactly backwards. Election is not a bar to salvation to keep people away. They're already barred by their sinful hearts. Their sinful hearts keep them away. Election doesn't keep anyone away from God. We picture election as God standing at the door of heaven. And all these throngs of people are knocking on the door. Let me in. Let me in. I want to be saved. I want to love God. I want to love Jesus. I want to repent. Please let me into heaven. And the Lord says, okay, I'll choose you, but you and you can't come in. You can come in, but not you or you or you. 
And that's not what's happening. The true picture is no one's at the door. No one's banging on the door trying to get in. They're walking away from him. They're neglecting him. They're ignoring him. And they're heading towards a precipice that when they fall over is going to lead them straight to hell. And so what God does is he lays hands on some of those people walking away and he turns them and he brings them back into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. The Lord has to do that because we are too sinful in and of ourselves to have what we need to cause our own spiritual birth. We can't birth ourselves. Did you, have you ever seen a baby who brought themselves into existence? It's, it never happens. And it never happens in the kingdom of God either. There, we don't birth ourselves. God does that birthing. So I don't want you to go away from this place thinking that Brian is teaching that there are people that want to be saved but they can't be saved because of election. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that if you're not saved, there is hope for you. If election was not true, there wouldn't be a ghost of a chance for any person to ever make it into heaven. There's no, there's no hope. There's, there's no possibility that you can be saved if election isn't true. Because we are too far gone. We're fallen. We're fallen in Adam. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We need something far greater than us to bring us into this kingdom. The Bible says there's none who seek for God. That's in our Bibles. Romans 3, I think it's verse 12. So it's right there. So election should never make you feel like you can't be saved. It should make you feel like it's possible for you. It, there is the possibility held out that you can be. Without it, it's impossible. With the election, now, yes, there is still hope. I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. I'm not dead yet. I, if I repent and if I put my trust in Jesus, I can be saved. But then once you do that, you find out the reason you repented and the reason you put your faith was because you had a sovereign God who elected you before the foundation of the world. Election's not bad news, it's good news. So we need to thank God for his unconditional election. Thank him for that with a humble and contrite heart. Okay. What about those people that believe God has chosen them? Let's say you're saved, you've been born again, so you believe, okay, God has chosen me. What should this truth do for you? I'm just going to mention three things this morning. Number one, it should make you humble. Because you realize your salvation had nothing to do with you. You're saved because of God's purpose, God's choice, and God's call. You were brought in and made part of the true Israel because of those three things. Not because of something good, not because of something bad, not because of works. It was because of those things, according to the Apostle Paul. If that's true, what do I have to boast about? <laughs> you know, we all know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works that anyone should boast. We know that by heart, but election helps us to, to understand Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 makes sense when you see that, oh, okay, now I know why I can't boast. Now I know that why it's by grace. Now I know why it's not of works. It's because it was of God from all eternity. So God wants you to be humble. And this doctrine, this teaching of the Word of God, will enable us to become humble people. Number two, it should cause you to give all the glory to God. Since we don't have anything to boast in, we should boast in the Lord. And that's exactly what Paul says over and over. Ephes or, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30 But let him who boasts, what? Boast in the Lord. In the Lord. God forbid that I should boast, this is Galatians 6.14, but save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ through whom I was crucified to the world and the world to me. God forbid that I should boast, save in the cross. Or Philippians chapter 3, where Paul talks about the true circumcision. It's Philippians 3.3. 3. He says, We are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. We glory in Christ Jesus. You see, God did it this way to the praise of His glory. He's creating worshipers. He's creating people who are on their face, 
with their hands over their mouth in the dust and saying, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to thy name give glory. It destroys pride. And it creates this humble, incredible thankfulness to our sovereign God. Number three, it should cause you to live a holy life. Election should cause God's people to live a holy life. That's what he's saying in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Notice this. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So he's saying, because you are chosen of God, because you're holy and beloved, this is the way you should live. This is the way you should live out your Christian life. You should be compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, patient, forgiving, and loving. And a person who exercises those fruits, those attributes, that's a holy person. Find any person who, who fits that description, you found a holy man or woman of God. Paul says, election, being chosen of God, leads to that kind of life. So brothers and sisters, thank God for his election. Thank him for it. And those that are not yet converted, be filled with hope that you too can be saved if you'll put your trust in Jesus and turn from your sin. You can know that he chose you if you will just comply, surrender, give up, believe, follow. So come to Jesus today if you don't know him. Amen. Amen. Lord, would you work today? Lord, we, we come to, a, to this, this truth that could be so difficult to accept. Lord, I know it was for me. It took me time. It took me a long time before I was willing to say, okay, okay, that's what it says. I'll, that must be what it means. I, I, I bow and I receive this truth. I pray, Lord, that you would cause this truth to have its intended work in the hearts of the people here at the bridge. Lord, make us a humble people Make us a holy people and make us a thankful people that give you all the glory. Use the truth of unconditional election to that end, Lord. And if there's anyone here that's not saved, Lord, would you call them by your grace? Call them, Lord. Convict them of their sin and point them to Jesus and open their eyes to see who he is. We pray this in your holy name, Lord. Amen.